there. Okay, now you're recording. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for, uh, for watching tonight. I'm very excited to be here to tell you the story. Um, it's one that I did absolutely did not know anything about before I began working at the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum uh, just about three years ago. And it was um, very surprising and, and very interesting. So I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to share that with you today. I'm gonna click this button on my screen that says continue and hopefully that won't be bad. Um, okay. <laughs> and I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation with you. So let me get that set up. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you this evening. Thank you to the Jenks Center. Very, very happy to collaborate with you uh, and to be included in your fantastic lineup of programming. Sounds like you have some really cool and interesting stuff there. So I'm happy to be part of that. Um, I began working at the Dallin Museum about three years ago. Before that, I worked in finance in downtown Boston. But what I really enjoy doing was visiting, you know, local museums, museums around the country, around the world, historic homes and that type of thing. And when I had a little bit of downtime, um, after leaving financial services, I was lucky enough to become involved with the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum. Um, I hadn't been there before. I didn't even know they were there, but it really uh, is a very unique and cool little collection um, in a historic home in Arlington. Um, my, what I specialize in doing there is outreach and engagement. And I um, am really missing the opportunity to coordinate group tours um, because of the pandemic, but things are loosening up a bit now. And hopefully I'll be able to get back to doing that again by the late summer. Um, and we are doing private tours uh, for groups of four, um, one, one to four. Um, on Saturdays and Sundays. So if, if anybody's interested in that, please um, reach out in the future. But just a little bit about our museum here. We were founded in 1995 and we're located in Arlington right off of Mass Ave, um, like at the intersection of Mass Ave and Route 3, very close to the Minuteman bike trail. And I hope what you'll learn from this presentation this evening piques your interest to come on and visit when we fully reopen and hear all of the other great stories about Dallin's works achievements and activism. Cyrus Dallin, who was he? <laughs> Cyrus Dallin was a celebrated American sculptor, educator, and indigenous rights activist who lived in Arlington, Massachusetts for more than 40 years. He was born in Springville, Utah Territory in 1861, a small Mormon settlement in the shadows of the Wasatch Mountains. And I will quote Cyrus Dallin. There was a clay bank between the Ute encampment and the settlement. When we got tired, we used to sit down at the clay bank and make models of the animals that roamed the prairie in those days. Antelope, wolves, buffaloes, and horses. That was where I got my liking for modeling, there at the clay bank beside the village of Ute teepees. And modeling in clay grew to be more than just a fun pastime for him as his exceptional talent became apparent at a very young age. And in 1880, at the age of 18, with the financial support of two local businessmen and proceeds from his parents' mortgage, Dallin moved to Boston to study with sculptor Truman Bartlett at his studio on Federal Street. Regrettably, Dallin and Bartlett had a tumultuous relationship. Dallin was living in meager quarters and often starving, so he left the studio to pursue opportunities that Bartlett did not approve of. I gather that Bartlett felt that despite his enormous talent and confidence and drive, this frontier upstart was audacious in contradicting his advice and not showing him an important Boston art critic due respect. Nevertheless, Dallin went on to spend two extended periods of study in Paris in the 1880s and 1890s, 
and necessary rite of passage for any young sculptor seeking to establish his or her reputation in the field. He studied with Henri Chaput, with whom he had a much better relationship at the Academy Julienne. And it was from Chaput that Dallin learned the principle of the beau art style, which emphasizes classical forms infused with naturalism and emotional intensity. In 1900, Dallin became a member of the Massachusetts Normal Art School, now known as Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston. And during his 40 year tenure at the school, he mentored a generation of Boston sculptors. He was a passionate yet patient instructor and his students fondly referred to him as Cyrus the Great. Dallin was a very prolific sculptor. In addition to his iconic Paul Revere monument, other important historical subjects include the Anne Hutchinson Monument at the State House and Massasoit Usumikwin in Plymouth. Dallin's commissions were not limited to the New England area, and he received a number of commissions from the Mormon Church, his most impactful being the Angel Moroni, an iconic symbol of the Latter-day Saints Church that sits atop the Salt Lake Temple, as well as temples all over the world, including one in Belmont. You can also see his signal of peace in Lincoln Park in Chicago and Medicine Man in Philadelphia. While Dallin sculpted many different subjects, he was most passionate about this land's indigenous peoples. As a child, Dallin became close friends with the Ute families who lived near the Springfield settlement, and he maintained relationships with those people throughout his whole life. The sculptures of indigenous people were intended as personal reflections on the humans that he admired and public commemorations of indigenous resilience in the face of ongoing subjugation. He spent the last 20 years of his career fiercely criticizing American imperialism and passionately advocating for the rights of indigenous peoples. He served as president of the Massachusetts branch of the Eastern Association of Indian Affairs a national organization that partnered with native and non-native groups on efforts to protect land rights and sovereignty, improve health care and education, and revitalize native arts among indigenous nations. Dallin was viewed as a trusted ally and collaborator by indigenous leaders and was one of the few non-native members of the Algonquin Indian Council of New England. Through his work, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself, folks, sorry. <laughs> Through his work, Dallin pioneered the role of artist as an agent of social change. For instance, the equestrian form was historically reserved to pay tribute to Anglo-European military figures. Dallin recognized and respected Native American historical figures, such as Appeal to the Great Spirit, using this type of imagery. He also adopted the heroic nude as a form of indigenous commemoration, and his Massasoit Usumikwin shows the native leader as a counterpart to Michelangelo's David, drawing a parallel between the story of David and Goliath and indigenous peoples and colonizers. Now, <laughs> now that you've had a little introduction to the life and works of Cyrus Dallin, we can move on to the topic of the evening, his quest to raise the Paul Revere Monument. In October of 1882, Mayor Augustus P. Martin of Boston established a committee to lead an effort to erect an equestrian statue to the memory of Paul Revere in Copley Square. The committee was comprised of members of the Boston Board of Aldermen, the Massachusetts Grand Lodge of Freemasons, members of the Revere family, and the Massachusetts Charitable Mechanic Association, for whom Dallin completed his first commission, their seal, for which he earned $2. The committee issued circulars inviting artists to send models in by April 19, 1883. A $300 cash prize was offered for the entries that best represented Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, 
Paul Revere's ride. Entries were unsigned to ensure impartial judging, and the young Dallin was almost certainly enticed by that cash prize. So just three years after arriving in Boston, Dallin entered Waiting for the Light. This was one of eight models submitted in the competition, and the committee was impressed with his work, as well as entries from Daniel Chester French and James E. Kelly. All three men were chosen as finalists. When it was revealed in the press that a 21-year-old novice from the West was chosen as a contender for this important commission over more established sculptors, Bostonians were incredulous, and Dallin found himself the target of such critical characterizations as Utah's cowboy sculptor and the youth from the godless Mormon city of Salt Lake. The Monument Committee did not select a winner, due to a growing debate over the historical accuracy of Longfellow's poem. Paul Revere did not wait to see the light in the belfry of the Old North Church. That signal was meant to inform patriots in Charlestown of the route of the regulars if something happened to Revere that prevented him from riding. The committee therefore declared all entries historically inaccurate. Additionally, the committee had hoped to consider an entry by Thomas Ball, sculptor of the George Washington Monument in Boston Public Garden. Ball had been working in Italy and had missed the contest deadline. In May of 1883, Dallin submitted a second model for a runoff competition with French, Kelly, and Thomas Ball. His second model presents Revere on his horse with a very spirited unconventional and vividly dramatic pose and gesture. Reining back his excited steed, the midnight messenger points with a straight arm in the direction he has come. His tense and anxious face almost speaks the message that he bears. And Ball's eagerly anticipated submission did not draw favorable reviews from critics. One such review stated, quote, if Ball himself were to view his lack in his work, speed and motion, and compare it with the spirited action of Dallin's plaster cast, he would confess that the neophyte got ahead of the veteran in one respect at least." End quote. Despite such praise, the committee remained undecided, still concerned about Dallin's age and lack of experience, assuming the commission would be too much for him to carry out. However, in June of 1884, Dallin was notified that the Revere Committee was ready to negotiate with him, providing he makes certain alterations to his model. So he set to work and finished model number three, which was studied by the committee who suggested additional alterations. Dallin com completed these edits and the model was sent to the Boston Art Club on November 11th, 1884. The committee finally approved the model and the persevering Dallin had finally won. The year and a half competition had come to a close. Unfortunately, the announcement in the Boston Evening Transcript said that Charles E. Dallin was a successful artist. Wonderful reviews of Dallin's model were printed in many of Boston's newspapers as you can see here, <laughs> I'll give you a second to read those. And his model also re received peer acclaim, came from his, um, uh, I'm sorry, acclaim came from the renowned Daniel Chester French, whose wife described Dallin's mixed emotions in winning the commission. She stated in her book, Memories of a Sculptor's Wife, quote, he was somewhat overwhelmed by the fact that he was not an Easterner, that he knew he would be looked upon as an outsider. He went down to his studio the next morning, somewhat discouraged and blue. The first thing he saw was a small note pushed under the door. It was from Dan French saying, I congratulate you. Yours was by far the best model. I'm glad you won, end quote. Dallin and French would become and remain friends and Dallin sought and appreciated French's creative eye on works such as Appeal to the Great Spirit. 
Dallin was to receive $25,000 in two years to complete the project. He signed the contract and returned it, but by some oversight of the committee, Mayor Martin failed to sign the contract, rendering it invalid until July 4th, 1885. Martin was not reelected to office, and on July 4th, 1885, an updated revised agreement for the statue was signed by Mayor Hugh O'Brien and Dallin. Unfortunately, such revisions to the contract included loopholes that might limit the sculptor's artistic freedom, provided no such city funding for the pedestal, and included a clause releasing the mayor and committee members from personal responsibility should their fundraising efforts fail. The new contract brought unexpected opposition rather than fresh hope. Early accounts mention only that the Revere project failed due to lack of funds, but later sources revealed that public confidence for the project declined after a disparaging letter from Dallin's former teacher, remember Truman Bartlett, was printed in the Boston transcript. In this letter, Bartlett severely criti criticized Dallin's model, declaring it, quote, an impossible man on an impossible horse, end quote, and protested against the award of a commission to such a youthful and inexperienced sculptor. And without much of any excuse or explanation, the committee practically scrapped the whole project. In 1892, after returning from an extended stay in Paris, Dallin was devastated to learn that his award-winning third model had disappeared from the gallery where it had been exhibited. He then completed a fourth model. According to Dallin biographer, Rel Francis, this model shows, quote, a maturity of modeling and surface design that reflects Dallin's European training, end quote. While the model was well received in the press, the monument project continued to lack leadership and political will. After a lapse of almost 10 years, Dallin created a fifth model in an attempt to renew interest in the monument. His new composition incorporated design elements of his two earlier works, most notable the front foreleg of the third model and a larger, more refined version of Revere from the fourth model. Mayor Thomas Norton Hart renewed Dallin's expired contract and gave the Boston Art Commission responsibility for the project. In December of 1899, the commission officially approved Dallin's fifth model. It was exhibited and viewed by Governor Winthrop Crane and other public officials. It received a glowing review from the Boston transcript asserting that Dallin, quote, never ceased to approve upon his original work, working on it in season and out, and remodeling it at least five times until, in the judgment of experts, he made of it a plaster work well worthy of a prominent location in Boston, end quote. In 1900, a newly formed monument committee issued a public appeal to citizens of Boston's to help $20,000 to fund it. The effort was unsuccessful and the project languished once again. Meanwhile, in 1907, Dallin contracted with P.P. Caproni and Brother, a Boston plaster casting company, to sell reproductions of the model in various sites to collectors and educational institutions. And the Dallin Museum is proud to exhibit a plaster model five, which is what you see here in this slide. Now I know I've been going on for a while now, but just imagine how Dallin must have felt. Remember that this monument was his first and last major work. And here we see what he looked like when he began working on the monument in his early twenties and still toiling on model number five into his seventies. In later years, Dallin reflected upon the frustration he had with the competition and noted, quote, I was disappointed, but not defeated. I learned that life is full of disappointments, but I have also learned to leave disappointments behind me and go on to something else, end quote. Very good advice, Cyrus. Three decades later, Dallin once again sought to revive the project by creating a sixth model 
which he exhibited at the R.H. White Department Store on Washington Street in Boston. With the exception of Revere's full billowing cape, this model is best described as a mixture of elements from his previous designs. While the statue received national, national attention in the press, Boston officials made no attempts to revive the long stalled projects. We'll go back to model number three briefly, because Dallin came across a photo of it while he was going through his recently deceased friend, Frederick Hall's things. The discovery of this photo prompted Cyrus, now in his 70s, to reflect on the important achievement of his youth. And he was inspired yet again to work on model number seven, <laughs> which he unveiled with an appeal to Boston Mayor Frederick Mansfield and trustees of the George Robert White Fund to support the effort. The George Robert White Fund is a trust that was left to the city of Boston to support beautification projects and still exists to this day. While Mansfield made a promise that the monument would be erected, the White Fund determined that the monument did not comply with the provisions of the trust and declined to support it. And at this point, Dallin took matters into his own hands. With the help of his son, Lawrence, he set to work on a full-size heroic scale rendering of the statue in clay at his own expense in his Arlington studio. The work took him four months to complete and required three tons of clay, some of which was hastily obtained by his devoted students at the Mass School of Art. His wife, Victoria, described the ordeal, quote, for months he toiled handling great quantities of clay going up and down a ladder day after day from morning till night, working with feverish intensity. The cost of such mental and physical exertion for a man in his 70s was tremendous. And Cyrus was a mental and physical wreck after the huge model was completed." End quote. The 10 and a half foot statue was subsequently exhibited at the Boston Historical Society and began a public campaign to pressure the city officials to act. In 1936, the design received the approval of the Boston Art Commission and P.P. Caproni and brother reproduced the equestrian in plaster with a faux bronze patina and exhibited it in their Washington Street Gallery. However, funding was still an issue. So in 1937, Dallin offered to sell the monument to the town of Arlington with the prospect of it being erected in front of Arlington High School. Pressure over the possibility of losing the monument may have motivated Boston officials to fundraise more aggressively. Dallin allowed the city of Boston to exhibit the plaster equestrian on the Esplanade during Art Week. And over the next two years, the statue was exhibited in public spaces throughout the city. Uh, in this slide, you see a photo of the unveiling on the Esplanade in April 24th, 1937, and left to right at the base of the sculpture, uh, of the sculpture is Cyrus Dallin, Police Lieutenant Thomas Harvey, Governor Hurley, and a young Paul Revere Auerhammer, great, great, great grandson of Paul Revere, and Elliot Wadsworth, President of the Boston Chamber of Commerce. In the fall of 1939, Dallin reached out to Mayor Tobin and the White Fund for financial support once again. This time, his request took the form of a parody of Longfellow's poem, Paul Revere's Ride. I invite you to visit our YouTube channel to hear our museum founder and Dallin expert, James McGuff, recite this version of the poem. Nobody does it better. <laughs> Finally, in December of 1939, the administrators of the White Fund voted to finance the Paul Revere Monument. And on January 17, 1940, Dallin signed a contract with the city of Boston. The statue was to be cast in bronze and placed in the Paul Revere Mall, also known as the Prado, between Hanover Street and the Old North Church. Dallin was to receive $27,500 for the statue, a mere $2,500 more than the amount he was to earn from the original 1884 contract. 
His sons, Lawrence and Bertram, were upset by the meager sum. Their father had expected to receive about $80,000 for the work at this point, and they initially objected to the terms. But their other son, Bertram, compelled the family to accept, saying, the money doesn't count, just do it anyway, our father needs this. And just when you think the story may be coming to a reasonable conclusion, heated discussions ensued between the Dallin family and the white fund manager, Joseph O'Connell, over where the statue was to be cast. O'Connell insisted the casting be carried out by T.F. McGann and Sons in Somerville, Massachusetts. Dallin preferred the Gorham Company in Providence, where he had been casting his works in bronze for many years, and whose fee was half the cost of McGann's. Meanwhile, staff at P.P. Caproni and Brother, including gallery manager that you can see here in this picture, Leo Toski, had commenced preparing the sections of Dallin's statue for shipment to the foundry until this shocking event occurred. With a Caproni studio worker as a witness, quote, gangsters with a big sedan stole parts of the model. It looked like they had guns and everything. They walked right in and knew just what they were after and took the essential parts, end quote. Caproni had no choice but to send the remaining sections of the statue to McGann's for casting. The Dallin family made the difficult decision to refrain from publicly accusing officials of wrongdoing, fearing doing so would delay the project even further. And then finally, the Paul Revere Monument was dedicated on Sunday, September 22nd, 1940. The ceremony featured band and chorus performances and speeches by such high profile Bostonians as Mayor Maurice Tobin, City Councilor Henry Shattuck and Joseph O'Connell. The statue was unveiled by Paul Revere Jr., a nine year old direct descendant of the Patriot shown here with Dallin in the newspaper clipping. What should have been a happy day for the family was overshadowed by tragedy, however, Cyrus and Vittoria had been informed in June that their son Arthur, who had joined the French Foreign Legion during World War II, was missing in action. According to the Boston Post, when several thousand people cheered as the statue was revealed, quote, Cyrus Dallin said he bowed when he was introduced, but that was all. Watching him, spectators got the impression that his heart and mind were too filled with emotion to permit him to do anything but sit quietly in the sun while the orators praised the name of Paul Revere and the deeds of early patriots, end quote. Despite the sad circumstances, Dallin's work of 15, 57 years had become a reality. What was his first major success had also become the capstone of a long and influential career. And some 72 years later, on April 29th, 2012, the Paul Revere Mall in the North End was the site of a celebration of the now internationally known landmark and to honor Cyrus Dallin's 150th birthday. Mayor Thomas Menino declared Cyrus Dallin Day and presented a proclamation to the Dallin family and the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum. And making the occasion extra special, was participation by dozens of family members and descendants from the Dallin and Paul Revere families. In the photo on the top right from left to right, you'll see Mayor Menino, um, David Kubiak, who is a friend of the Dallin Museum and orchestrated the whole event, Jean Dallin in the green jacket, and Paul Revere Jr., the now 81-year-old boy, who helped pull the sheet off during the original dedication ceremony in 1940. And shaking hands with David is the one and only James McGuff, founder of the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum. In studying the history of the story, I've come to reflect not only on Dallin's enormous skill as an artist, but his tenacity in the face of bureaucratic and financial challenges that might have driven the average man to throw in the towel. Luckily for Bostonians, Cyrus Dallin was no, no more afraid of a nearly impossible idea 
than was Paul Revere. And with that, I conclude my story and ask you to check us out on social media should you like to see what we're up to on a regular basis. And um, we'd love to have you into the museum sometime if you want to stop by. We're, we're very close by. So I'd like to um, engage everyone and ask that if you have questions, please put them in the chat function and we will answer them as they come in. Do I have to stop share to see the chat? Yes. Uh, no, well, you don't, but yeah. yeah. Okay. That was really a very interesting story and, and so inspirational. I mean, uh, I'm an artist and I find that I get discouraged easily. <laughs> <laughs> and so sensitive oh my I, goodness I just imagine you know it was such a big deal for him as such a young man to receive such a huge commission and then to have all these stumbling blocks and like he knew he could do it and he should do it and he wasn't going to give up <laughs> yeah, I truly love um how it evolves you can kind of see that the um growth in the statue itself, like you can see his age being represented, right? At first, he's this very dynamic, young, you know, you can see it in the statues, right? And then yeah. as he's evolving and changing and growing and you see that it's just, he's more relaxed and yet you still see all the, the motion and the tension and the, but he's, his statue is just a little bit more, I'm in control. Yeah, that's a very good point. And actually, um, if I had my, if, if I had those pictures back up, um, model number two definitely has a more like a wild, youthful kind of look to it, while the final model is regal and more restrained, but but yeah. still a man on a mission. Exactly. You can see his growth really in it, right? I think so. So we have a question. Um, <laughs> Oh, the sound <laughs> cut on on my computer, so I didn't hear what happened to his son. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so in overseas on the day that um, Revere statue was dedicated. Yes, so uh, his son, um, Arthur, unfortunately, was uh, killed in action. He had joined the French Foreign Legion in World War II um, because he was actually born in Paris while um, Cyrus and his wife were, were in Paris while he was studying there, and he felt felt an allegiance to the to the country of France. So he joined the French Foreign Legion and fortunately was killed in action. Uh, they didn't get confirmation of that until after the monument was installed, but they were notified prior that that he was MIA. So well, that was very sad for them. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Where are all the Revere models now? I think that um, there, a lot of them didn't survive uh, because they were made out of plaster. None of them were ever cast. So um, they, they are gone. <laughs> They're crumbled and gone probably because uh, we do not have any. We've done extensive research looking for them and, and I, I believe that just because of the, of the material they were made of at the time, they're no longer, um, no longer. Mm, that's sad. Okay, any other questions? I visited the Dowling Museum oh. um, a year and a half ago or two years ago on a, on a private tour. Oh, nice. And it is wonderful. And I would really suggest that everybody go and see what it is, what is there. And the tour guide was incredibly knowledgeable. So it was, it was a really great tour and amazing to see what was there. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, we have some new stuff since your visit, uh, Phyllis, is it? Um, over the last, uh, you know, we've been closed because of the pandemic, but we've had stuff going on and we have some new oil paintings of his uh, on display. And I think 
This may have come in um, within the last year and a half. There is a bust of um, Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh, that's new to the collection, which is which is pretty which is pretty cool. So we, we have some new things that we would love to share and um, come come on in. <laughs> Actually, in the meantime, um, if you wanted to have a, a nice night out in the summertime, on um, a few Thursdays, including this coming Thursday. June 17th, um, we are hosting a walking tour. So it starts at the Dallin Museum um, and it kind of covers about a three block radius. Um, and it features some of Dallin's um, outdoors work, the Flagstaff and Monotony, Monotony Hunter, as well as a couple of other interesting uh, historic buildings and the Uncle Sam Memorial, not done by Cyrus Dallin. Um, but it's a lovely, you know, just about an hour, and it's a really nice, it's a nice evening, evening out. Um, if you haven't seen Monotomy Hunter and that Robbins Memorial Park, it's, it's really absolutely beautiful. I highly recommend checking that out. So we have a few more questions. Um, what was his final commission for the statue? I don't think I was. Oh, yeah. Was B-wise? I think so. <laughs> Well, I, it was so it was the 27,500, but I believe that he ended up probably spending some of that money because, because he, you know, he had to cover the cost of, of materials. And I think, well, this is just, I'm guessing this, he may have gotten more than 27,500 had they not needed the additional funds for the pedestal. Um, which is a fairly costly part of a project from, from what I understand, so. So was um, his studio in Arlington and um, they wanna know where? Uh, yep, so he lived on Oakland Avenue in Arlington Heights um, and the house is still there and his studio was in the back of the house. Um, okay. And whoever. it's uh, privately owned by someone else, obviously. Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah, so we don't want to. That the same the family. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so did the Dallin family live at the museum location at any point or was this given later or like? They did not actually. Um, the, that house was not Cyrus's house. I like to tell people that up front when I, when I welcome them to the museum because I think people assume that it was his home. But it was actually the home of a miller named Jefferson Cutter. Um, and the home was originally located on the... Um, property of Myrac Chevrolet. Um, they were going to demolish the house, but the town of Arlington convinced them to not do, do so. And they donated it to the city and they also paid to have it tra tracked down Mass Ave to its present location um, on a flatbed truck. Apparently a very dramatic <laughs> event as well. So, I think so. Jefferson Cutter <laughs> House. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, could you repeat the time and date of the walking tour? Oh, certainly. Um, I can send you folks a link. You can uh, go to our website, www.dallin.org, and there's a program and events tab there. Can gives you all the details, but I can give you basic detail right now. It's this Thursday evening, uh, the 17th at 6 p.m. And we're also hosting one on July 22nd. August 26th and September 16th. Excellent. Are they all Thursday nights? They are. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Any other questions? No. That was really fascinating. Thank you so much You're for that. Very welcome. I'm very very welcome. Much for that. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's, you know, it's, it's 57 years worth of material. So thank you for bearing with me as the story goes on and on and on. I try to, try to give yeah, some. It's fascinating. It wasn't boring at all. No, it was really good. Really good. Thank you. I want to hear more. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know more. You painted in oils as well, right? So. Yeah, that was kind of like a, um, that's kind of a thing we're, we're discovering um, more of uh, as fa uh, some family members have donated some that they've just had in their personal collections. 
Um, and one of our directors actually found one, um, I'm not exactly sure where he found one, out at an auction and donated it to the museum. Um, and we're really looking forward to sharing that one with the, with the public soon. Um, it's called Mrs. Hall's Letter. I had mentioned that um, he came across a photo of his beloved model number three while going through his deceased friend, Frederick Hall's things. And this oil painting, Mrs. Hall's Letter, is Frederick's mother, who he stayed with um, after leaving Truman Bartlett's studio. Uh, when they had a falling out. So it was, a, it was a nice period of time for him where he was taken in and fostered while he was trying to get his career going. Such fortitude. I mean, I'm gonna face my art now and say, I can do this. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And he certainly did, you know, there, there's, the, there's so many pieces of public art um, and one of them that I'm looking forward to visiting this summer um, down in Provincetown at the Pilgrim Memorial, you know, the big, the big tower. At the base of that, there's a, um, it's like a, a, a huge bar relief that he did. Um, and I, I, I really have to go and get a look at that because um, those are so cool. And with, the, you know, with vanishing points in perspective, like on, on a flatter surface, I'm fascinated by those. They're very cool. So. Excellent. Okay, one more chance. Any other questions? Can you talk a question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, no, I, I just think people should know that the museum is right in the center of Arlington, right on Mass Avenue. So that if you go there at 6 p.m. for a tour, uh, you can also all the lovely uh, uh, restaurants and stuff. It's a park, but it's the Cutter House. It's, it's really delightful. Mm. And you don't have to walk very far to see the beautiful Monotomy Hunter, which is really breathtaking. I love that. It's my, my favorite piece, actually. And they oh. just recently renovated that garden. It's an Olmsted design garden. And it's, it's lovely, really lovely, special piece. Mm -hmm. Is there a fee for the tour? Uh, there is not. There's, there's like a suggested donation, but it, it, it's also gratis. So you can decide. Excellent. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this, this evening and filling us in on. Oh, that was just such a great story. Thank, Thank you. you. It was my pleasure. I, I love telling the story. So <laughs> I'm glad uh, to have such a great audience. And thank you very, very much for having me. And, and we hope you also have... What was that, Pat? Did you say something? No. no, I was just saying, and you tell the story so well. Oh, well, thank you, Marsha. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that. It was excellent. And we're hoping to also have you on the WinCam in August. Um, I think that- Oh, yes. You, do a, you might be doing a, an in-person tour, right? That yes, we're, we're looking forward to that. I, I was um, just, I pushed that off just a little bit because um, there are some renovations to the park mm -hmm. that are happening like in the coming week. And I just feared that you know, there might be a lot of background noise from digging and clanging and all of that. And I, uh, I want our little presentation to be clear as a bell. <laughs> so Excellent. yeah, we're looking forward to that. Great. I'd say one more thing, um, as the director would mention, it looks like the Museum of Fine Arts. I mean, it's like this fabulous spirit statue. I grew up in this, I I'm old and it's always been there. But who knew it was a local artist that did it? And did weren't you honored by the Massachusetts, the uh, Museum of Fine Arts? Didn't you have a program together last year? Or we did, we did. They were kind of. Um, it was a when was that? That was I think that was in March of 2019, and it was uh, just a discussion of different perceptions of appeal to the Great Spirit. Mm. Um, and like we were trying to convey what what we feel Dallin's message was, and there are some people who have different ideas about that. But as a as a Native American advocate, it was meant to be a very positive expression. I and love it. it. Shows. it shows. <laughs> I mean, you can see that. Yeah, it's definitely positive. It definitely embraces, you know, the nature and um, honors them. 
honors them. Definitely. Beautiful. An interesting little bit about that piece is um, I had mentioned that he was friendly with Daniel Chester French and the original um, appeal to the great spirit had a figure on either side and uh, Daniel Chester French saw that in the studio and recommended removing um, the side the side figures just so the one beautiful majestic figure could just speak for itself and uh, I think it certainly does it's it's really striking really beautiful mm -hmm. okay well thank you so much it was really really a wonderful presentation You're welcome. it's my pleasure thank you for having me and thank you everyone for coming this evening Hillary Bye. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Hillary. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> great group. That's great. Oh, it's so much fun. We have such a good time. Happy. Marsha, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>